thing I did is have the mic, but it's right there. Thank you, Mike, for our speaker. Let's welcome her again.
Sergeant at Arms Bill Morillo. All division governors, please stand up to be acknowledged. Please stand up to be recognized. Our contest today will provide us all with a tremendous learning opportunity. So let's preserve this learning environment. Please take a moment to turn off or silence any device that makes noise. Cell phone, pager, rusty jack. <laughs> Please turn them off. Please do not take photos during the time. Flash count, yes. Contestants, timers, ballot counters, judges, sergeant at arms have all been briefed prior to this contest. Everyone is aware of the Toastmasters International Rules that govern the contest. No one should enter or leave the room during the contestant speeches. You may do so if time permits and the minute of silence between the presentations. After our last contestant, please do not leave the room until it's been determined that all ballots have been collected. And with that said, let the contest begin! Here is the speaking order for the International Speech Contest. Contestant number one, Charles Bernstein. Charles Bernstein, contestant number one. Contestant number two, Eric Fanning David. Eric Fanning David, contestant number two. Contestant number three, Tracy Denar. Tracy Denar. Contestant number three. Contestant number four. Rannan Harris. Rannan Harris. Contestant number four. Contestant number five. Charles Bruce. Charles Bruce. Contestant number five. Contestant number six, Heather Ball. Heather Ball. Contestant number six. Contestant number seven, Diane Bolat. Diane Bolat. Contestant number seven. Contestant number eight, Connor Kareem. Connor Kareem. Contestant number eight. We will proceed with the international speech contest. There will be one minute of silence between each contestant. Timers, when I advise you to do so, please give me a signal when the minute of silence is up. After all contestants have spoken, the judges will be given all the time they need to complete their balance. We will now begin the international speech contest. Are you guys ready for it? Yeah. Yeah. Yes! <laughs> Speaker number one, Charles Bernstein. One shade of gray. <laughs> One shade of gray. Charles 
mind, pushed his glasses a little higher on his nose, and somehow took a slug of vodka from a thin flask, offered me a drink. I took it. <laughs> and with some effort, he straightened himself up, and he looked right at me. I tell you a little secret about life. The older you get, the more you have to say, Bye. The more you come to appreciate life and find beautiful things in life. I never forgot what he said. But I had no idea what he was talking about. <laughs> I might be young, but I know all about life. This guy's got one foot in the grave and he's telling me he thinks life is beautiful. As I realized that I was no longer young, or even middle-aged, and as I thought about the people, talents, abilities, and the dogs, I had to say bye-bye to them. I finally started to understand what that old man was trying to tell me. Simple things in time can become profoundly meaningful. To be able to go for a walk or look up at the sky is a blessing. When you're young, you think you have all the time in the world and it's easy to take life for granted. But that old man helped me to understand that it's important to appreciate, to see what's there. That's what growing old means. For as long as we can. And you can get a sense of that when you're young. You're ahead of the game. Speaker number two, Eric Fendale. Child's kindness. Child's kindness. Eric Fendale. <laughs>
It was a week before Thanksgiving 2013. I was chaperoning my six-year-old daughter, Rachel, to a friend's birthday party being held at the local entertainment center. The building was filled with the sounds of digging, cha-chinging, and birthday singing. <laughs> Despite all the bleeps, bloops, and bright lights, however, our attention was diverted in the direction of a boy, about eight or nine years old, who went by the name Kyle. He had his cap turned back, sleeves pushed up, and a fierce determination in his eye. He was playing the, oh, so addicting, claw game. <laughs> Here's how it works. You put in your dollar bill, out comes the metal claw, and you also delicately drop it on a pile of goodies in the hopes of winning a prize. Now it may seem innocent, but then again, Zoda's trying to eat just one Oreo. Even <laughs> more. As we watch Kyle fail, unfortunately, time and time again, to win his prize of choice, a fuzzy pair of dice, we notice that he began to pace back and forth. Sizing up the dice, but check out the green lion, which size up his prey. His obsession became so intense that a small crowd of people began to gather around him. And we heard one person say to another, there might be something wrong with this kid. <laughs> That's when my precious Princess Rachel gazed up at me with those big, beautiful blue eyes and gently whispered, Daddy, will you and me a prize? <laughs> Her heart's fancy was instantly captured by a stuffed, droopy-eyed puppy dog who she swears only had eyes for her. <laughs> I said, sweetie, Dad's not very good at this game, but please, Honey, let's find something else to do. But Dad, you're my hero. <laughs> okay, then it was game on. <laughs> now they know that trick real early in life, don't they, gentlemen? <laughs> I put in my first dollar bill. Out came the claw. It just missed, and the whole crowd went, oh. <laughs> I put in my second dollar bill. Out came the claw. It got jammed, and the whole crowd went, oh. I could feel the sweat build on my brow. I had one dollar bill left. I was almost out of money and out of patience. I put in my final dollar bill. And I swear, I could hear George Washington chuckle and see him wave goodbye to me on the way into that machine. <laughs> Out came the claw. It caught the puppy dog. It was on its way over to us when, just as the last moment, like that monster fish almost in the boat, it slipped off the hook. And the whole crowd went, <laughs> The look on my daughter's face was as if she just found out. There's no Santa Claus. <laughs> I just stood there, speechless, hopeless, clueless, drenched in the agony of defeat. As the crowd began to disperse, we noticed Kyle, still standing, <laughs> just staring at us, analyzing us much like a doctor would a patient. And I heard someone say, yet again, there might be something wrong with this kid. <laughs> Rachel and I went back to the party. We had our fill of more games, pizza, and birthday cake. But the whole time, I couldn't help but wonder, did Kyle ever win his prize? About an hour or so went by, and as we were leaving, I went back over for the claw machine. And there I saw Kyle's dad. I gave him the father-to-father -father nod and asked, did he win anything? Before he could respond, I felt a tap in my left arm. And it was Kyle standing there. And he firmly placed something in the palm of my hand without uttering a word. It was the stuff to be a puppy dog. Oh. I was so desperate to win for Rachel. But then his father said, Kyle has autism. He doesn't say much, but he's watching. He saw how much your daughter wanted that puppy, so he gave up his quest for the dice to win that for her. Mm -hmm. Now shake his man's hand, Kyle. As I put out my hand to shake his, I gave the puppy to Rachel. She, in turn, gave Kyle a hug.
and I got one too. And then she said, no, you're both my hero. You see, there was nothing wrong with Kyle. But some people might label him simply as a child of autism and nothing else. Kyle's kindness changed that. I encourage you, the next time you're given a label, please remember Kyle's kindness. Because for Rachel and myself, his label will forever be hero. Speaker number three, Tracy Denar. Taste and flour, the recipe for life. Taste and flour, the recipe for life. Tracy Denar. I'm 
the adult count. And I'm reminded of a boss that I had. And one day he was so angry with me because a box of checks had been moved and he thought that I moved them. And he lent it to me and he let me have it. And I looked at him and I wanted to crumble like paste and flour. But I stood there and I looked him straight in the eye and I took it. And I thought, I am not going to crumble. I'm going to be a woman of faith and power. Little did I know that he had been going through some personal issues and I just happened to be his sounding board. He apologized later on. It was that experience that led me to create a recipe for life. And I'll share it with you. This is a recipe that helped me to overcome a lot of challenges. The first thing I thought of as an ingredient was to mix some collaboration. And that helped me to get along with people and become a team player. I also learned to mix in some assertiveness. And assertiveness helped me to have the courage to network. And then I mixed in some critical thinking to help me think quick on my feet. And to listen to people as to what they were saying and what they were not saying. And then I put a dash of initiative, which helped me to take charge, to make things happen without having to wait for someone else to do for me. And then I did another cup of self-assertiveness and self-awareness. And that helped me to get control over my own emotions. And then I sprinkled some vocabulary in there. And that helped me to understand the language of people in my environment. And finally, I had to put in two cups of thick skin. Because I realized not everyone is going to like you. And you will get teased. I also realized that not all the time will we do a good job. And we just may be corrected. And I also realized that people that you really love just might leave you. And I also discovered that it is inevitable that someone will get angry with you. So tough skin is so important. So I mix that all together with that adhesive, with that tasted flour, and I put it in the oven and turned it up to 400 degrees. Because after all, Life will heat you up. <laughs> and how many know that when you are heat up in life like that, when you are in the fires of life, we need to learn how to overcome those kinds of adversities. So this was my recipe. And I am still in that fire, but I am no longer paste and flour. I am now faith and power. And I can look at challenges and obstacles square in the eye and overcome those things. Now, these were my ingredients for my recipe. Perhaps you have one of your own. And if not, well, you are certainly welcome to use mine. Mr. Tulsa. I mean, at the silence, please.
Speaker number four, Ramon Harris. Rise up and be the phoenix you are destined to be. Rise up and be the phoenix you are destined to be. Ramon Harris.
They went to the movies, had a great time. Then when they returned home, he went to heat up his food from dinner. And when he went to heat up his food, he tried to press the start button on the microwave. It didn't work. His hands were wet, he had just made tea. So what he did was, he reached behind the microwave. He had removed the paneling from behind the microwave, because this is he had done several times before. He stuck his finger from behind the microwave and then tried to hit the start button. But this time he hit a point. It's an electric shock through his body that it would not be able to, it wouldn't be able to withstand. Unfortunately, I lost my brother that day. Can you imagine the guilt that I felt? It was two weeks after he had asked me for that microwave and I could have sent it. But of course, life got in the way. I was working, preparing for tests, and doing everything else that I did not think to send him that microwave right away. I didn't know that he would pass. So now I stand here on April 26th, his birthday, and I think and I remember, reminisce about everything that happened. I had to think of all the positives in that situation for me to get through it. So what did I do? I became closer to my oldest brother. Now we're best friends. We talk all the time now. I have to remember that when one door closes, there's another that opens and everything happens for a reason. In life, we're given many challenges where we can crash and we can burn. But it's about how we get through those situations that makes us the phoenix that we are destined to be. So, I do leave you with this. In your life, you will be faced with challenges. Losing a sibling, having to prepare for a test, or anything else that comes in our way. But it's how we get through those things that will propel us and make us get through any situation that we might come in contact with. So the next time, a situation comes your way. Will you crash and burn and stay down? Or will you rise up and be the phoenix that you are destined to be? Mr. Tuffman. Speaker number five, Charles Brooks. If there was no money, how rich would you be? If there was no money, how rich would you be? Charles Brooks.
Is that what value starts with you? Well, I'm here to tell you that value starts on the inside. You see, everything that you need to be successful in this world starts on the inside. Value cannot be determined by trinkets. Who can you walk alongside and add value to? Who's asking you to mentor, <coughs> coach, or teach? Who's ringing your phone? Asking you questions? Who's sitting at your feet trying to learn? I had a mother with an eighth grade education that sit in the projects of Chicago and taught younger parents how to raise their children. When I see those people today, they still talk about Clement Brooks. You see, the first thing that you have to have in life to do anything, and it does not matter what it is, is a foundation. If you don't have a foundation, it's like building a home on some sand and expecting it to stand. You cannot stand without a foundation. How are you building your foundation? What are you ingesting into your being? Are you a prolific reader? Do you listen to lectures? Are you a part of any worthwhile organization? Like this one. <laughs> Where self-development can be had by all. Chip sign on the dotted line. You see, that's this guy. His name is Stephen Cuddy. We gave him the Golden Gavel Award not too long ago. He wrote the Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And you have to ask yourself, are you an effective person? He said, in order to be one, that you had to be proactive in life, which means you have to prepare. You see, I'm a boy scout. The Boy Scout model says, be prepared. The Girl Scouts say the same thing. Are you prepared? Do you begin with the end in mind? Do you prepare to ensure that you finish the race? Do you put first things first? The important things in life. Are they the first things on your list? Do you think win win? Or do you think win lose? Or lose win? I always like to go into any discussion thinking that I want to come out a winner, but I also want you to feel like one also. Do you seek to understand? Then to be understood. Or is it all about you? How about your? synergistic life. Who do you surround yourself with? Like-minded people or people that you aspire to be? Do you sharpen the soul? Physically? Mentally? Socially? You have to do those things. Because if you don't, you will begin to regress in life. Everything has to be maintained. It was designed that way. It was designed that you would have to take care of yourself. You see, this body is not self-sustaining. It needs substance, but not just food. It needs information. It needs to be cultivated in a way that you continue to grow and develop and every day. This organization allows you to do just that. Are you taking full advantage? Are you completing your assignments? Or oh. 
Are you not? Because it's all a choice of what you want to do in this world. So if there were no money, how rich would you be? Or would you be homeless, middle class? Would you be super rich? Would you be the headlines when they're talking about financial well-being? You see, when you develop yourself, when you develop the inside, when you cultivate it, it will sneak out and make you look so darn good, it ain't even good. You should be like a V8 engine, not a storage box. A V8 engine with dual exhaust, where you are just spurting out information, where people are growing because of your knowledge. If there was no money, how rich would you be? That's a question that you have to ponder. That's a question that you should take home with you and think about. Because the value of you is not in the shopping mall. The value of you lies within. The best things in life are free. Speaker number six, Heather Vaughn. Ingredients to a confident and fearless life. Ingredients to a confident and fearless life. Heather Vaughn. Lacked vision and 
fewer goals. Seeking inspiration, I've read the autobiography of the first black billionaire, Reginald F. Lewis. He says whenever he was uncertain about where he was going on his way to the top, he would walk as if he knew where he was going. As I began to move in power, how everyone saw me change, but more importantly, how I saw myself change. Confidence is mental. You all know someone who is a little bit more confident than you think that they should be. <laughs> but who am I to tell that person that they should not believe in themselves? If anything, I should see their fearlessness as permission for me to live my truth. But how do you believe in yourself before you believe? Say it until you make it. Yes, I know that's cliche. But the ideas of confidence, they have to find a home here in your brain before they can even begin to reach the heart and resonate with the entire world. So as my mind and my body began to work in unison, the universe opened up for me. The last element of confidence is the most important. It's what the flesh, bone, and trappings of this world would rather you and I forget. That is because confidence is spiritual. Confidence is spiritual, not just what you do or don't believe when it comes to religion. It's also that awareness that the ability to conquer whatever you have to is the nature and essence of who you are. And it's been there since your very first birth. No better example of that for me is when I look at my seven-month-old self. I'm in the hospital with a 106-degree temperature. Pneumonia. Yes, the doctors did an excellent job. But there is another side to science that is there to remind us of who and what we really are. And there it says that energy cannot be created nor destroyed. But it can be transformed. So that same desire to live that existed within me then is within me right now, and it's demanding that I stoke that spirit, that energy, until the aura of my self-assurance and resiliency of all I've overcome shines undeniable. So even if you do believe that a Savior has come, a Savior will come, or that concept never existed. Remember this. Time and mind, they are the exact same thing. They both can be wasted, and they wait for no one. So know that within this mind and in this time, you are the one you have been waiting for. Now I ask you, what's holding you back from being more confident? Confidence. It's physical, it's mental, it's spiritual. Those are the ingredients to lead a fearless life. A life where you can hold on fearlessly and let go. Fearlessly. You don't make mistakes of who to trust and where to go along the way. But all the while you grow, fearless. <clears throat> now join me as we shed those ideas and those beliefs that no longer serve us. So that we can step into our destinies because the choice to live life without fear and confidently is not only our duty, it is our right.
Speaker number seven, Diane Bolash. Feast the season. Feast the season. Diane Bolash. You have to become a warrior. 
a weed warrior. And pluck those things that other people have sown in your garden. Whether it be your well-intentioned parents, your boss, your spouse, even if it was your second grade teacher. You see, everything does have its season. And everything has its time. And this is the time, this is the season to explore that. Now, truth be told, I do have to confess, every season is my favorite. Because the season of imagination becomes the season of planting. And the season of planting becomes the season of cultivation. Although, I do prefer Santa's ho, ho, ho to the ho, ho, ho of tending the garden. But still, without every season, we would never have the harvest. We would never be able to cultivate, to tend, to transform ourselves, and to yield the truth of who we are. So I invite you, get comfy. Consider the crops you've been growing. Have you been propagating peace and joy and wisdom in your world? Have you been cultivating kindness, character, compassion in your community? Or are you telling truth, justice, and integrity in your everyday experiences? Oh yes, gardens and all weather sport. And I invite you, everything has a season, everything has a time. And right here, right now. It's time to imagine what your life's garden can be. Right here, right now, pull out that catalog and consider the choices. Explore those insights. Right here, right now, choose. Right here, right now. Speaker number eight, Connor Canine. <coughs> Mr. Brown's question. Mr. Brown's question. Connor Canine. <coughs> Mr. Contest Chair, fellow Toastmasters, and welcome guests. It was one day before my ninth birthday, and I had been caught for about the fifth time ringing the doorbell of our elderly neighbors, Mr. and Mrs. Brown, and scampering away. <laughs> now, here at my birthday party, one day after the crime, in walks Mr. Brown looking for me with a soccer football, and he says, hey kid, Happy birthday, with a big, beaming smile. At that age, I was a bit of a scamp. 
When a few days later, that misdirected soccer ball decapitated Mr. Brown's red roses, <laughs> he was not particularly happy. But the next time I saw him, he had that big beaming smile for me again. What he nearly always did, despite my reign of mischief and mayhem. When I was 12, Mrs. Brown died. At her funeral mass, my dad dragged me up to Mr. Brown. Apprehensively, like I'd seen the, the, the big people do, I offered my hand to Mr. Brown, who, sobbing, heartbroken, he simply ruffled my hair and said, good kid. And I cried. I cried not tears of sadness, but tears of regret. Because I wanted Mrs. Brown to know that I could be a nice kid, and now she never would. And I didn't click I could be nice to Mr. Brown. But a few weeks later, my dad and I we were walking the cobble streets of our little village when we heard the haunting, sweet sound of the violin. It was the local street musician known as Top Hat. He wore a top hat, it was battered black, that often doubled as a money bag. My dad passed some coins to Top Hat, who still played, said, thank you, sir. And something motivated me, and I passed some coins carefully in the bag. And Top Hat, he stopped playing, he said, thank you, young man. And my dad, he ruffled my hair, said, good kid, and I, I felt so good. Maybe it was because it was the first time in my 12 years I've been deliberately nice to someone. <laughs> but I felt really good. And as we walked home past Mr. Brown's house, it did click. I could be nice to Mr. Brown. That evening, I rang his doorbell. Sir, can, can, I, can, can I cut your grass? Yes, kid. Then that big, beaming smile. Kid, don't cut those red roses. <laughs> Everything was good until I realized he only had a push more. <laughs> Every Tuesday that summer, I cut his grass, even helped with the prize red roses. And we started having important conversations about important things like my favorite soccer players. And I first heard Mr. Brown's question. During one chat, he said, Hi, kid. He always called me kid, never Connor. <laughs> hey, kid, Mrs. Brown, you say, the only reason why I never broke your neck is because you were like me. <laughs> but you're always smiling, and you never get mad, well, except sometimes at me. <laughs> kid, I do get mad, but when things go wrong, I ask one powerful question. What do I want my attitude to be? One powerful question. What do I want my attitude to be? When later that year, Mr. Brown passed away, this kid cried tears, not of regret, but of sadness. During my teenage years, Mr. Brown's question lingered. When my best friend went off with my girlfriend, <laughs> my best friend, I asked myself the question, what do I want my attitude to be? It didn't help. <laughs> but as I grew into adulthood and parenthood, I came to see the power of Mr. Brown's question, especially when things go wrong. A few years back, my doctor said, Anna, you have prostate cancer. As I drove home, wrestling with the news, I heard, one powerful question. What do I want my attitude to be? And I answered it as I think Mr. Brown would have liked. And I said, I am going to beat this. I have previously beaten cancer of the thyroid. I am going to beat this. So I went into the hospital for prostate surgery with the right attitude and with a brand new pair of Monty Python pajamas. <laughs> Pajamas bearing the legend, it's just a flesh wound. <laughs> in, 
Indeed, I can truthfully tell you now that having had a thyroidectomy and a prostatectomy, I have a unique condition known as there's not much left of me. <laughs> surgery I started singing Danny Boy to my wife. Why? It's a song that drives her crazy. That the kids and I would only ever sing to drive her crazy. But I knew that she was crazy with worry. Hey, the cancer was not a cakewalk. I had sleepless nights. My darling wife had sleepless weeks. But today, thankfully, we do sleep easy. When things go wrong in life, there is not always a good answer. But there always is a good question. When things go wrong in life, that question, what do I want my attitude to be? As it helped Mr. Brown, as it helped me, would also help you from time to time. And today, when I ask myself Mr. Brown's question, and I do often, I like to think, that somewhere in a much better place, Mr. Brown is taking those prize red roses, roses that never fade. And he nods in agreement with that big, beaming smile when his lovely wife says, See, the kid, he is like you. Mr. Connors, chair.
Thank you. And now, let's get to know our contestants. Contestants, please join me on the stage in the order in which you spoke. It was a 
nighttime soap opera that aired for about six years. It was fabulous and it transformed many lives in Chicago. Yeah. Hey, are you planning on going back to that? Or are you very well, fascinated with speaking? Well, I, I love speaking. I love transforming lives. That's my passion. And I'm still working with the, uh, the committee. We're doing an awakening in March against, um, for nonviolence, actually. It's going to be July 26th. It's a plug for that. It's going to be out, out in, I believe, Grand Park this summer on the 26th. So we're, I'm very still, I'm, I'm still working with them. But well, wonderful, Tracy. Thank, thank you, you so much. much. Thank you.
bit of a split personality, this time three years, but I was the Toastmaster of Michigan for five years in the mid-90s. All right. Which club are you representing? I am a proud member of Mount Prospect Club 1500, the friendliest club in the district. And this month, the partiness club. We are looking forward to celebrating our 60th year on May 6th. Interpreter. What have you learned about communication in that field? I have to say, my friends tease me because I can finally talk. I'm usually the person in the corner. <laughs> so it's kind of fun for me to be able to talk. But the blessings of doing that job is that the interpreter is challenged to match the speaker. So if the speaker's good down home boy, I get to sound like a good down home boy. <laughs> So being exposed to, I can't tell you, even tell you how many speakers over 25 years, I think I was able to pick up an awful lot of tips before I was able to talk for myself. <laughs> Thank you so much for the
Governor, drum roll, please. Derek Simon fantastic uh, event uh, to all the competitors. It was a really good competition and there was so much variety in the whole competition. It was different to the, the norm, I think. I'd like to thank uh, particularly my darling wife, she's down there, Pat, who's been a, a rock all of the, the time. She keeps saying to me things like, uh, have you rehearsed the, the speech? And then when I rehearse the speech for half an hour, she says, you're spending too much time rehearsing the speech. So, <laughs> But she's been an absolute break. There's so many other people here I'd like to, to thank. I don't know if Prez is here right now, but uh, he has been, I helped him a lot last year, but he's been a great help to me also this year. So now I've got to start uh, practicing my swimming stroke to swim to Kuala Lumpur. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. I'll do my very best to represent this big party. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Ready? Great. 